And now with the lesson for this morning, Eric Brandt. I have often wondered what it would be like if the Apostle Paul were to come to the Church of Christ at Albany to present a lesson. Can you imagine what that would look like? If people learned about it, they could say, yes, it is verifiable that the Apostle Paul will be at the Church of Christ at Albany on such and such a date. Can you imagine the frenzy that would be created? We're not just talking about bad traffic in Aldi. We're talking about bad traffic in, on the East Coast. In, I mean, there would be mayhem on all of, the, all of the airports. There would be mayhem on the Internet, because, of course, this would have to be live-streamed. There would be mayhem everywhere. I mean, the, the tickets that would have to be sold? It, it, it's unimaginable. Just think of when the Pope came to visit and just multiply that 50, 100 fold, 1,000 fold, it's unimaginable because, of course, we can't imagine anything like that happening. The Apostle Paul lived in the first century. He doesn't live now. But can you imagine if he were to come back, what would that be like? People would be holding on his every word, maybe some genetic way for reanimating the Apostle Paul could be figured out, and we could have one last message. What would he say? What would he be like as a person? Well, I don't know. But I can imagine what he might say. I can imagine what would be important to him. Because we have words from him. And we can hear the Apostle Paul speaking to us even today in the scriptures. In fact, more letters are written in the New Testament. More of the New Testament is within his words than any other apostle, than any other person. And we have that benefit today. And so if we would cancel our vacation, if we would, if we would set aside a bunch of money in order to take a trip, although here we, we, we get to just be here and hear him, if we would do that, then we have his words. We would sprint to our Bibles to find out what would he have to say. We would treasure his words above everything. And we would say, yes, I want to hear what he has to say because he is truly an apostle anointed by God to preach the good news, especially to Gentiles. So he would tailor the message just for us. Isn't that exciting? Well, guess what? We, get, we, we can know, I imagine we can know, a large amount of the substance of what he would preach. And I imagine the gist of what he would have to preach would be something kind of like this. He would say, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, be filled with the power of God that was exerted in Christ Jesus when God raised him from the dead. And that very same power is available to us. It is the same power that equips us, that enables us, that empowers us to put off our old character and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power that allows us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism, and it is, the la it is the power that allows us to be transformed by the renewal of our mind, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that creates in us the character of Christ. First of all, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that is what somebody conformed to Christ is like. We know something about what Paul would say because we know how he addressed other congregations. In his last visit with the elders at the congregation in Ephesus, we kind of learned what his last words would be. And essentially, he said, be strong in the Lord. He said, Difficult times are going to come from you, are going to come for you. 
He says, from among your own number are going to come people who, like ravenous wolves, are going to try to devour the flock. And you must stand firm. You must stand strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He said he had poured out his life for the church at Ephesus. He had poured out his life. He said, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, compelled by the Spirit, he was going to Jerusalem, not knowing what would happen to him there. He just knew that the Holy Spirit warned him that prison and hardship were facing him. And that indeed happened. And we know that he wrote a lot of letters from prison. And the letter to the church at Ephesus was one of those letters that he ultimately wrote from prison. So we find out what is important to him by what he says and what he wrote. Be strong in the Lord. We know what is important to Paul because we know what he prayed for. He prayed for the church that they would know that they would know that their eyes of their heart would be enlightened that they may know the breadth the height the depth the length of the love of God that was in Christ that they could be rooted and built up in love escaping <laughs> that they could know his incomparably great power to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He says that power is the same as his mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that can be invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. These are spiritual powers in the heavenly realms. He raised Christ from dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. We learn that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms as well. So there is a spiritual battle that is going on. But notice that Christ is above all of these powers, all of these authorities, all of these dominions, far above all rule and authority power and dominion and every name that can be invoked not only in the present age but also in the one to come and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything in the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way so Christ has the authority over every power this is said in his thanksgiving and prayer in the first chapter of Ephesians. He says another prayer in the third chapter of Ephesians, and he prays that out of Christ's glorious riches, that he may strengthen the Ephesians with power through his spirit in his inner being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the Lord's people, to grasp how high and how wide and how long and how deep is the love of Christ. Do you hear a refrain? Do you hear that he is repeating his idea? So he prays twice of this, to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory and in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So we learned what he said to the elders at Ephesus. Kind of his last words, he says, look, I'm leaving. Things are going to get rough. 
but remember these things. I have not ceased to declare to you everything that I could about Jesus. Then in his letter from prison to the Ephesians, we know what his will is, that they can be strengthened with the power of Christ and be filled with his fullness and know the depth, the height, the breadth of his love that surpasses knowledge. That they be strong in the Lord. And we also know he wants them to put off their old life and to be established in this new life. To put off the old life when they followed the prince, the power of the air. When they followed these invisible forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And he wants them to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and his character and follow in the strength of his might. So we know what he said to the Ephesian elders before he left. We know what he wrote to the Ephesians, what he prayed twice for. And then, to wrap it all off, he said, in case you didn't get my message, you know he, how he uses all these wonderful uh, transition words that I get so excited about, things like so, therefore, and so forth and so on. And every time I've come to one of these transition words this week, I've kind of jumped up for joy because it shows his thought. Well, how about this ultimate transition word? Finally. I, I would expect, I, I would have thought people would just cheer and say, woo, cheer, yay, go Apostle Paul. It's like, the final word is this. Finally, what do you think Paul would say? He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Have we heard that before? Please say amen or please say yes. Yes. Paul wants us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And, and he mentions these principalities again, these principalities, and, and he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, he says, be prepared. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand your ground. He warned the Ephesian elders. He said, look, troubles are going to come from among you. There are going to be people who want to tear this church apart. So be strong. This is not just a flesh and blood battle. This is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual battle fought in the spiritual realms. And it, it requires a spiritual answer. So be strong with spiritual armor. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, Apostle Paul reminded the elders at Ephesus, a day of evil will come. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, stand strong in the faith, be strong in the Lord, stand firm then. And now he starts telling them how to be equipped. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Be well equipped. Now you can watch YouTube videos about, what do, they, what do they call it? Do they call it boot camp in marine boot camp uh, at Paris Island, where they run off the bus and they put their feet on, the, on those yellow, yellow uh, feet footprints, and they get their hair shaved off and everything is, sir, yes, sir, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, down, up, down, up, sir, yes, sir. And so they get their new haircut, they get their new clothes, they move from civilians, and they start this discipline. They turn from undisciplined civilians, undisciplined teenagers, yeah, man, cool, to, sir, yes, yeah, sir! Push, 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 they get pushed up there, up there. They are turned into battle-ready Marines. And so this is what we are called to do. We are called to be equipped 
The belt of truth is the first equipment that we have. Is truth important? Please say yes. Yeah. Truth is important. Okay? Truth is important. It matters what we believe. It matters what we say. Okay, I know I'm getting kind of excited here. You're allowed to say, Eric, calm down, calm down. All right. Yes, truth is important. It matters what we believe. It matters what we think. It matters what we believe about God. It matters what we believe about Jesus. It matters what we believe about the nature of this world. It matters what we believe about what happens after this life. And so the belt of truth, you kind of say it kind of holds everything together. Belt of truth buckled around your waist. The Christian life is one seeking after truth. Seeking after truth. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. So our faith is in vain if we do not believe it is true that Jesus lived, that he died, that he rose again, that he ascended to the Father, and that he will return, and that he is in the process of recreating a new heavens and a new earth, and someday what we see will pass away, but what is unseen is eternal, and we need to believe that. The belt of truth buckled around your waist, so we seek after truth. Next, the breastplate of righteousness in place. The breastplate of righteousness in place. You can also watch YouTube videos where they do tests to see whether a, what, cast iron? I, I'm not cast iron. What, whatever they used to build breastplates in the medieval realms when they were still fighting with spears, bows and arrows, swords, that kind of thing. They would, they would I, don't, I don't remember what they built it with, but they, some Swedish guys who were dressed up in medieval garb where we're testing, not on a human being, thank you very much, but they, they put one of these breastplates, I guess, in front of a um, bale of hay. And then they took a longbow, which I guess had about 300 pounds of pressure behind it, which they estimated is about what they would have used. And they, they took a dead shot from about 30 yards to see whether or not the, the, the arrow would penetrate the, the breastplate. And thankfully, well, no, it didn't. It, it scratched it. It nicked it. But they said, yay, it has come through. The breastplate has prevented it. That, that, that soldier will live another day. Well, the breastplate of righteousness in place that will protect us from the flaming arrows of the evil one. It's integrity. It's structural integrity. We are told to put off the old person that is corrupted according to its evil desires and put on the new person conformed to Christ. The breastplate of righteousness helps us avoid lots of problems. If we are people of sound, good, godly character, it will keep us from a lot of snares because we won't even go that way. Our mind won't be going off into all kinds of strange places that it doesn't need to go. It will help keep our lives strong, and it, it'll help us to be good examples. The breastplate of righteousness in place. And it's not only, it's not because of right things we have done. It's not even our righteousness that we are clothed with. We are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. It is Christ that is creating his character within us as we are submitting to him in the power of of the Holy Spirit, the breastplate of righteousness in place. And then with our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. All right, folks, I confess to you that my best intentions to exercise have so far not been fulfilled, but I'm not giving up. <laughs> I'm not giving up. What I learned is, well, you need to, you need to put all of your gear right where you'll get it when you get up in the morning. So instead of having to go into your closet, get out your running shoes or your clothes or whatever, you put them right there. When you wake up in the morning, you get into your running shoes and you get going. Or at least you structure into your life. I'm sure you can teach us, uh, <laughs> Brother Gallus here could teach us how to be strong and physically fit. You have to build it 
into your life. You have to be ready to go. The readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You need to be ready to go. You need to be ready to do what it is that God has called you to do. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Faith is an important word for Paul. We are told it is by grace we have been saved through faith. And this not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Faith is so important. We are called to trust God. The shield of faith. People throughout the generations have had to trust God, and some of them have gone through terrible trials, terrible sufferings. We can read about those in Hebrews chapter 11, heroes of faith. By faith, people left their countries, and they went to a place God was guiding them to, but they didn't know what was going to happen. They trusted that God would be able to fulfill his promises to them. By faith, they even testified to God in front of the, they were fed to the lions. Some were torn in two. Some suffered in unimaginable ways for their faith. Yet they did not give up. They trusted that God would fulfill his promises. And it even says that they did not receive what God had promised in this life. They didn't even receive it in this life. They said, well, they suffered. God didn't come through. Well, they knew that in the next life, in the heavenly realms, God would fulfill his purposes. And this has been a shield of faith for people throughout the generations. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. When we go through trials of many kinds, we can just trust God. And we say, I trust you are going to make it. You are going to see me through in this period of time. Then take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Sir, yes, sir. You know, I, I watched, I remember being on the uh, Beltway a year or two, three ago, and I saw a motorcyclist being thrown off his motorcycle, and he literally, he, 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 he hit some kind of bump. He was thrown up, and he was in the air, and he bounced. I've never seen somebody bounce. But, and, and, and by God's grace, he got up. And, and by God's grace, and I would have been the first person to hit him had there not been enough, enough um, leeway. So, I mean, he, he was on the, thankfully all the cars stopped. You know, he, he was clearly stunned, but then he started to move and then he you know, his, his bike was down this way and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I, when I don't drive on that area of, of the Beltway without thinking of that. You, you, you don't forget that. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember seeing a, a police officer uh, just right up here on Georgia Avenue. Thankfully, he didn't fall off his motorcycle, but he, he was wearing, you know, a metal motorcycle helmet. And I just keep thinking, you know, whenever I see that, I say, okay, well... I hope that metal motorcycle helmet, that white metal motorcycle helmet, would protect him should he fall off. Uh, it's quite risky, uh, but we need, the helmet is perhaps the most important piece of gear that, that we have. It protects our brain, it protects that from which our life, um, uh, that, that central part uh, with, without our head, we don't live, the helmet of salvation. Uh, we are, uh, you could say, well, the helmet saved me. The helmet kept me from dying. If it weren't for the helmet, I'd be dead. Well, we, we learn in various ways, in various parts, about the salvation that, that God has given. We read, for example, in the letter to, Timothy, or to Titus, uh, in one of the other pastoral epistles, where Paul talks about uh, that God's grace has appeared to us, the grace of God that appears, that offers salvation 
to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope. So it is the grace of God that brings salvation, that teaches us to say no to ungodliness, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. And then later in chapter 3, verse 3, it says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. He saved us. He saved us out of that life of debauchery, of darkness, of foolishness, of disobedience. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done. I mean, we were foolish, we were disobedient, we were walking in darkness. It was not because of our righteousness He saved us but because of his mercy, of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us. That having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So the helmet of salvation by the grace of God, giving us the hope for eternal life, the helmet of salvation, and then the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the only offensive weapon, if you want to call it that. The other parts of the armor are defensive. This one is something that can be used as an offensive weapon. We know that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It is able to penetrate even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the, the sword of the spirit is able to cut through the foolishness. It's able to, to I don't know, it's almost like an x-ray machine. It divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And it helps us to to be conformed to the character of Christ. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and indeed it was the Word of God that Jesus used when he was tempted. He quoted Scripture. And so we need to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then finally he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. He says, with this in mind, with prayer in mind, be alert, be alert in prayer. Always, always keep on praying for all the saints. So pray for other people. You pray always. And he says, pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. He asked for the prayers of the people so that when he would preach the word, he would be able to make it clear in a way that people would understand. The mystery of the gospel. He said, for which I am an ambassador in chains. And he indeed was writing from prison. So he didn't think that his ministry was curtailed just because he was in prison. But he desperately asked for the prayers of the people. And, and as a preacher, I can say... I definitely um, appreciate and, and requests, and I'm sure Tim would say the same, for the prayers of the people, that whenever we open our mouths, that we may have the words that we may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. So, be strong in the Lord. Have the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Have that breastplate of righteousness in place. Have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Take up that shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. Pray, pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. <sighs> Shall we pray together? Father, there is so much that 
we need. But we pray, O oh God, that you might indeed break through any strongholds that might be in our minds that might be preventing us from appreciating how strong we are when we are in you. Help us to be strong in you. Help us to break through to a new sense of your grace, a new appreciation for how high and how wide and how deep is your love. Please help us, O oh God, to grow deeper. Help us to put away anything that can prevent us from growing strong in you. Help us, along with the brothers and sisters who strove to be like you at Ephesus, help us, O oh God, to be joyously strengthened in you. Forgive us when we turn away from this glorious calling, and please open up our eyes so that we can understand anew the greatness of your grace and love. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Typically, during an invitation, I will ask if people have any prayers that they need. That, that question is always open. I also typically ask if anybody wishes to put on the Lord in baptism, and that invitation is always asked. But I may change, so those invitations still remain open. But I think also, I want to invite us all this week to search our hearts and to see, are we strong in the Lord? And if we're not strong in the Lord, to ask God to show us what it would take for us to be strong in the Lord. Maybe there are some things we need to put off, and maybe there are some things we need to put on. So... My prayer, as we sing the song of invitation, that we just simply ask God in this, in this time that he would indeed help us to be strong in him and, and guide us in any way that we might need to go. Whatever that prayer or whatever that need, whatever um, the Lord may guide, may he do that while we stand and sing the song of invitation. Um.